many entreat the favour of the nobility, and every man is a friend to one who gives gifts. All the brothers of the poor hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He may pursue them with words, yet they abandon him. My name's Arthur and I thank you for joining me as we share together from Proverbs chapter 19, verses 6 and 7. Solomon is again looking at the fickleness of friendship and the nature of relationships between people and the fact that a person who has wealth has the potential of having lots of friends, particularly if he is able to give gifts or does give gifts. As the previous proverb said, the person who wants to have friends must be friendly. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother, was the last verse of Proverbs 18. Here he says all the brothers of the poor hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He may pursue them with words, yet they abandon him. What Solomon is pointing out is that even in friendship we tend to be very selfish. Rather than fidelity, we have wealth and money as being a great driver in relationships. So those who are of the nobility, those who have lots of money, they hang around together, they invite each other to lavish parties and those who are poor, they must hang around together but when a person becomes poor, people don't want to know him. His brothers want to disown him His friends flee far from him. I'm reminded of the story of Jephthah. He was the oldest of a set of brothers, but he was the son of a harlot. And his younger brothers did not want him to inherit any of the father's estate because he was illegitimate. He wasn't from their family, and so they drove him away. They didn't recognize him as an older brother. They hated him forcing him to be poor. He gathered around him outcasts of society. But he was the one that God chose to lead and deliver the nation. We can think about David. He had seven older brothers, but they looked down upon him. They despised him. He's the youngest. He's the weakest. He has no standing. And yet he was the one that God appointed to deliver Israel from Goliath. And he was the one who became friends with Jonathan. They made a covenant with each other. Jonathan, who was the prince of the land, and David, a friend indeed, who is closer than a brother. Again, we come to the Lord Jesus and his brothers. He was the oldest, but he had a different father to them. They didn't understand him or support him, but they pressured him so that he had to leave his home when he got engaged in his public ministry. Even his brothers did not believe in him, we're told. Although they had seen his life, and later they would become believers and followers of the Lord Jesus, they had learned his ways in a completely different way to the disciples. They had seen Jesus live just as a citizen in society so different from the ways of the world. Well, many entreat the favour of the nobility. If you want someone to help you, you don't go to a poor man, you go to a rich man, and particularly one who seems to be generous. Every man is a friend to one who gives gifts. And if you can't actually give gifts, well, you can pretend to be rich, and you can make promises. That was the way that Absalom stole the hearts of the people, setting himself up to take the throne from his father, David. That's the way politicians get elected. They make promises about things that they're going to give to the people, whether it's new hospitals or new roads or new schools or whatever it is. They think of things that they can give. Of course, they're not giving it from themselves. They're giving it from money that's taken from the people. But there's a certain superficiality there. Every man is a friend to one who gives gifts. We know that so very well. Is this the real basis for relationship? Money? We find that the Lord Jesus gave himself for our sins 
while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So this is a complete reversal. While the people of the world look for noble people to be friends with, Jesus chose the ignoble, the sinners, those who were estranged from him. Because the chief goal of the gospel is for God to re-establish relationships with people. Paul emphasised that with Timothy. This is a faithful saying that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I exhort first of all, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. So God is reaching out to establish a relationship, a relationship of friendship, a relationship of sharing, where he listens to us as we listen to him. Jesus told the story of a man who had a visitor late at night, and he didn't have any bread to give him. And so he went banging on his neighbour's door, Friend, lend me some bread. The neighbour was not too inclined to get out of bed. Go away, I'm in bed. Everyone settle down and quiet. Shush, stop making a racket. He kept banging and so his neighbour got up and gave him the bread. But God is much more desirous to help us in our need because he has the resources. This is God making friends. Every man is a friend to one who gives gifts. And yet, Not everybody wants to come to God because God's gifts aren't for self-indulgence. He is the ultimate nobility. He is the ruler of the whole earth. He has great power, not just because he has great money and owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth of every mine, but he has the spiritual hosts. He is the Lord God Almighty and he can bring things to pass which are beyond our comprehension and understanding. And he wants to give gifts to men. He ascended on high and gave gifts to men. And what is the gift that he has given? Well, the forgiveness of sin. He gives the Holy Spirit to enable us, to help us, to live holy and godly lives. Of course, when you receive a gift, you don't necessarily use it. And so the sadness is that there are people who are saved who you would hardly know. But happily, there are others who have developed their friendship with God. They've entered into the relationship, they've made God their friend, and they live changed lives. All the brothers of the poor hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? It's a sad indictment that we like to improve our standing by being seen with the nobility with the successful, and to avoid the company of those that people know are poor, the losers. And so brothers will turn away from one who who does not do well, and those who were his friends will dissociate themselves from such a one. They will go far from him, even though he chases after them. Help me, help me, yet they abandon him. Because we're also self-centred. We're living for ourselves. But this should not be so, as the Lord Jesus always did those things that pleased the Father. The Lord Jesus went out of his way to associate with sinners, with tax collectors, with harlots, anyone who he could seek to rescue. If they would accept him, he would receive them. But he came to them as one of no reputation, of no standing not with wealth, not with material gifts. So the relationship of friendship is so fickle. You can have friends among people who are at the same level of you. You will seek friends from those who are more noble. You will dissociate yourself from people who are poor. But that's not God's way. God's way reaches down to seek and to save the lost. The lost.